Hey YouTube and welcome to my latest video. I know it's been a while, I'm sorry about that. Sorry to all my active subscribers, I know there's so many of you. <laughs> surprise, surprise, this is not going to be an unboxing video I'm afraid. Uh, although there is one coming next week and it is for the F-Stop Miller Brooklyn Sling DSLR camera bag. So please stay tuned for that one, I'm hoping to upload that next Wednesday or Thursday. Right. I've been thinking of getting back into my videoing because I'm so poor at it and I really want to practice more in front of the camera and one day I might actually produce a half decent quality video. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I'm going to do over the next couple of months maybe. I got inspired a few years ago by an author called Richard Carlson who sadly passed away in his 30s. I was listening to one of his audio books that I purchased online. It was a time that I really needed to listen to something like that. Cause, uh, and it really helped me at that time. And so I was doing a search of Richard Carlson because I had a good vibe about this guy and searching for him on YouTube, see if there's any video clips, any interviews, see if I could get to see the person who I've been listening to in real life. So as I was searching on YouTube, I came across a channel by Ross Merrick. You'll be able to search for him on YouTube. That's R-O-S-S-M-E-R-R-E-C-K, I think. Have a check. Anyway, his intro goes a bit like this. This is Ross La, Ross La, Ross La, Ross La. Ross is reading time. Okay, I can't sing, but if you come across that intro, that's Ross. This is Ross Merrick. Yeah, it's from America, so it's really good. <laughs> I'm not good at these videos, hey? Anyway, crack on, Raj, crack on. So, what Ross did was, he was reading one of Richard Carlson's books, Don't Sweat Small Stuff, and it's all small stuff. And it was a, probably Richard's most famous book, so it's something that I was interested in. Now, I wasn't sure what he was doing, if he was doing a review of the book, but basically what Ross was doing, not Richard, was reading a chapter from Don't Sweat Small Stuff in every single video. Now, I don't know how motivated he is to make these videos because I think over the space of three years he's got about halfway through the book and I might just send him a message to see if I can complete his video series as a guest reader. But anyway, so I'm going to do the same. Now, I'm not going to start off with a chapter a day or a chapter of video, but I do plan on doing that as well with this book called Courage, The Joy of Living Dangerously Dangerously blah, blah, blah. Dangerously by Osho Now, I'm not sure if any of you have heard of Osho but he's been very inspirational to me It was uh, introduced to me by a friend and after reading this book it had a massive impact on me, I've actually read it three times and it really inspired me to travel the world and with my job and I got a lot of positive things from reading that book so I can recommend that and I'll come to that in another video in the future I'm not sure when but I'll get there now what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about a subject called stuttering now I'm sure that you've met a stutterer in your life somebody who struggles speaking and I also used to have this problem as well for 31 years and it was very it was very severe and it's a massive part of me even today I want to still give something back and a few years ago something that did really help me was some YouTube videos by Dr. Morton Cooper and after watching these videos my speech for the following two weeks was one of the best it's ever been in my life and so I wanted to do some research, I read his website, tried to find anybody who'd work with him and it all seemed quite positive ups and downs you know some people had were really against his ideas but anyway I related to them and so I ordered his two books on voice and stuttering and those were winning with your voice five minutes a day to a more effective winning voice and change your voice change your life a quick simple plan for finding and using your natural dynamic voice now I'm going to read a chapter from this one here today and it's about this chapter that I'm going to read maybe 
five, six pages long, so it won't take up too much of your time. So I'll get down to it. And if you know anybody who stutters, you can maybe pass on this video. And in case they don't have this book, maybe they'd like to listen to a chapter or not. Whatever you want to do. Okay, so I'm going to start halfway through one chapter, which mentions stuttering. And then I'm going to go into another chapter about stuttering. So it's, it's not too long. So, okay, here we go. Hi, sorry about that. I'm not sure if you noticed if I took a little bit of a break there. Somebody called me from the window and then I realized that I needed to place my orders for work. So I was on the phone for 20 minutes and it's now dark outside. Uh, okay, we was at the beginning of reading this chapter from Change Your Voice, Change Your Life. A quick, simple plan for finding and using your natural dynamic voice. So here we go. Now, as I said earlier, I'm gonna start halfway through a chapter and then I'm going to go on to the next chapter, which is very short, maybe four or five pages long. But I saw the word stuttered, so I thought I'd start there. So, here we go. I'd just like to point out I'm not a professional reader. I don't read out loud very often. I can't remember the last time it was, so please... I can't remember the last time it was, and it was ages ago. So, forgive me for any mistakes. Or not stopping at a full stop, okay? <laughs> Go easy on me here. A young woman who had stuttered since the age of five became a botanist because plants don't seem to care if you're verbally handicapped. She would rather, she confessed, be have become a doctor. But doctors have to talk to people. It took her a full 60 seconds to articulate this simple sentence. A young man who had had a terrible sounding voice my whole life elected to become a writer in the field of educational research, a career which he dealt with. The written word rather than the spoken word would insulate him from people who had always reacted negatively to me when I spoke, he said. The mere act of talking had always been a physical effort for him. He had frequently been asked to repeat himself throughout his childhood, his adolescence, his college years and his voice frequently failed to work at all. His voice problems had been attributed to allergies. But I developed peripheral mannerisms that I can trace directly to my vocal difficulties, he explained. I began mumbling when I was a kid and I acted aloof, pretending I wasn't interested in others. I wanted to reject them before they rejected me. But he encountered one problem he hadn't planned for. He was a gifted writer who became an expert in his field. His professional peers wanted to meet him and discuss his work. It was horrendous. I could tell they were put off by my voice. As soon as, I, as they got the basic information, they would leave the room or hang up the phone. I felt more alone and more dejected than ever. This sense of loneliness is common among those who have experienced serious voice impairment. If you are one of the countless in this group of voice suicides, you needn't feel alone anymore. Yes, that's right. There's help for you too. Like the teacher, the insurance salesman, the botanist, the writer, you can discover the rewards of healthy, natural, successful communication. You can rejoice society. Rejoin society. Confident of having a well-functioning voice. You will use the same methods of voice retraining described earlier in this book, but you will have added insights to get you on your way. As for the teacher, several months of functional voice retraining brought back the voice that two years of analysis had failed to resurrect. The insurance salesman recovered his voice too, and the botanist ceased stuttering. The writer learned to use his right natural voice and felt at ease with himself and the world for the very first time in his life. It's gratifying now to talk to people, he told me at our final session. The quality of conversation is so improved. The content is the same actually, but it goes further to the point where I have real relationships. And then he confided the following to me. I had a dream, a conscious dream, about a year ago. I decided to fantasize about the best possible life I could have. 
I wished for a better job, one that wasn't so isolated. I wished I could be more socially alive, and I wished for a better voice to allow it all to happen. By now, the young researcher had a good, healthy voice. His sound came from the mass, complemented by balanced tone focus. He still discreetly monitored his breathing occasionally, while talking by simply placing one hand on his midsection to ensure correct breathing technique. Six months later, I received a telephone call from this man, who had formerly spoken only through his writing. His new job was very rewarding, he reported. He spent only half of his time in research and writing now, and the other half travelling and lecturing. Public speaking is easier than I ever thought possible, he said in a rich, full, natural voice. The young man described above was afraid of verbal communication most of his life. As a consequence, he avoided it. Once he had mastered the basic elements of voice usage, however, a whole new world opened up to him. He was confident enough to accept a new job that brought him out of the laboratory, whose insulation he had long coveted and insisted upon. He was courageous enough to attempt public speaking, by which he would formerly have been mortified. Yet, he was actually enjoying it. Having a voice, his right natural voice, gave new meaning to his life. He was finally an active participant. Excuse me. Note that his voice dysfunction was not caused by a fear of communication. Rather, his fear of verbal communication was caused by his voice dysfunction. This is frequently the case among voice suicides and is veritable by the fact that once they are possessed of a functional voice, especially one that serves them well, fear and anxiety and vocal expressions seem to completely vanish. This is the reason that I stress the basics of voice production in management of voice disorders. I normally find that whatever psychological factors and stresses are said to be present, it is the voice misuse and abuse that cause the voice dysfunction, and whatever the precipitating circumstance, a wrong voice model, a calm trauma, exposure to excessive air conditioning, it is a lack of voice training that allows voice misuse to be perpetuated. Once a wrong voice has been established and used long enough to produce negative results, emotion and tensions can and do aggravate both the voice disorder and the psyche. And so it is that the voice retraining, voice psychotherapy are carried out simultaneously. Wrong voice models must be eradicated at the same time the wrong voice is being shed. By the time the right voice has been identified and achieved as a habitual sound, the psyche is ready and able to accommodate a new sound concept. Here we have a successful transition from negative habitual voice to positive new voice image. Notice that in voice psychotherapy, it is vocal neuroses that are discussed and modified. No mention is made of deep-rooted or psychological neuroses because their possible existence does not seem to inhibit the functional use or retraining of the voice. My role as voice therapist is to aid the patient in achieving a functional right voice, a dependable, dependable, dependable clear and dynamic sound in the most straightforward and direct manner possible. And so we do. But there are exceptions to every generalization, of course. Fear and anxiety do enter as casual factors in two of the most troubling disorders, spastic dysphonia and stuttering, but with curious twists. Spastic dysphonia is often called a monster voice. This is because the sounds that emerge from its victims are quite truly monstrous, strained, broken, forced, guttural. As you will soon see, life itself becomes terrifying for individuals who suffer from this dysfunction. So it's not surprising that their initial fears and anxieties escalate and further torment these individuals. Stuttering is a more familiar stigma to the general society, manifesting itself as a forced, laboured stumble in speech or as an abnormal, rapid repetition of certain sounds. This condition is viewed with derision, mockery, and avoidance by those with normal speech patterns. In fact, the stutterer is not a foolish, weak or flawed person at all. When, then, 
does he or she sound as he does because he has a more perfectionist learning while stutterers suffer from from the same dearth of knowledge about voice usage as the rest of society resulting in a misplaced pitch lack of tone focus incorrect breathing technique and wrong voice models most have a misconception about speech patterns that sets them apart from the rest of us in their verbal expression they believe that speech should be perfect and this is where fear and anxiety come into play in the majority of stuttering problems the anxiety that attends the desire to create perfect speech instills a fear of failure to do so which in turn creates imperfect speech it's a classic example of a self-fulfilling prophecy it's a classic example of a self-fulfilling prophecy prophecy i'm tired but it's a prophecy that recurs over and over again in the life of a stutterer plunging the victim ever deeper into the abyss of his speech habits still he tries even harder to force a perfect speech image and fails he begins to develop a fear of certain sounds such as a th sound or an s sound and now he starts anticipating these sounds when he talks and tries to perform them by placing the tongue against the back of the teeth or pressed hard in the roof of his mouth he cannot talk when his tongue is stiff of course so more disfluencies occur by now the habitual speech is filled with machine gun like repetitions or drawn out stumbles excuse me and sometimes distracting body postures are taken on because of these difficulties in communicating adding to both physical and mental tension and exacerbating exer exacerbating how do you say that exacerbating the fear and anxiety <laughs> stutterers led for the most part by false images and wrong illusions about effective communication do not understand or accept what most of us blithely take i'll say literally it says blithely literally take for granted normal speech is not perfect it is filled with hesitations repetitions prolongations o's and ers sighs what i call bobbles most of us do pause when we speak we do make mistakes but we pay no attention to these minor imperfections and continue dialogue without concern for them stutterers however find it hard to accept that bobbles have a legitimate place in speech I advise these patients to listen more carefully to the way non-stutterers speak, to tune into their pauses, hesitations, prolongations in the course of conversation. Furthermore, I require their listening to certain talk shows on radio and television, again to observe even celebrity interviewees put bubbles into their own speech. This is the first step in acquiring stutterers with the reality of verbal expression. Once they can hear these bubbles in what is considered normal conversation, they can begin the transition to a more sensible and practical voice image in themselves. Some stutterers resist this alteration in speech attitude, and quite understandably, since their handicap has usually been with them for a very long time. It customarily begins between the ages of three and seven. Adult stutterers thus face conversion to a new image of acceptable speech after a virtual lifetime of embracing an illusion about vocal expression. One such patient, a young man in his 20s, refused to accept bubbles as a function of normal speech. He consistently invoked the examples of television and radio announcers, as well as news broadcasters. Their voices might be flawed, he allowed, but their speech was fluid, constant, and perfect. I couldn't dissuade him from his point of view even when I proved to him that announcers and reporters read their material and so are not proper models of conventional speech. Even the Fonz doesn't talk with bubbles, he declared, and he's not reading his lines. He does a whole show in front of an audience without one mistake. 
like many young Americans, he's 22 year old. This 22 year old has grown up with the cast of the Happy Days situation comedy. So I arranged for us to attend a taping of one of their shows. I sat next to my patient but said nothing as Henry Winkler and Ron Howard and the rest of their cast bobbled their way through a taping. One scene was reshot 16 times until it was performed perfectly. The O's and ers, as well as the hesitations and repetitions would have been very acceptable in real conversation, mind you, but these minor unmistakable imperfections would not play on national television. When the show ended, I sat in silence for a moment. Finally, I turned to my young friend. So what do you think? I asked. He laughed and slapped his knee. You're not k k k kidding me, he answered. I know you asked them to put those bubbles in for m m m m me. In time, even this stalwart stutterer gave up his misguided notion of perfect speech however, and made the change to healthy speech patterns, as well as healthy voice patterns, with his voice in the mask, complemented by proper tone focus. He also learned to differentiate between hard and soft contact of the tongue while speaking. In hard contact, the tongue becomes still and presses against the teeth or the roof of the mouth. This happens because the stutterer learns to fear certain sounds and thus preforms them but the tongue then interferes with speech, blocking not only sound, but the breathing process as well. Indeed, stutterers, like many in society, don't breathe at all while they talk, when they are tense or pressured. Sometimes they hold their breath when they speak, or they inhale, exhale immediately, and then proceed to talk without any breath support whatsoever. This habit is particularly common among stutterers and spastic dysphonics, but it is not unusual in the general public too. Once correct breathing has been implemented, the stutterer then works on achieving soft contact of the tongue when talking, allowing it to move freely and fluidly to pronounce and form sounds as they re are required, not as they are anticipated. This is a gradual process during which the patient literally re-educates himself to think ahead in ideas and concepts rather than in specific sounds. This allows the tongue to stay relaxed and to make soft contact within the mouth as thoughts are spontaneously articulated. The intent here, as with all voice or speech deficiencies, is to help the individual achieve his natural right voice as well as a positive speech and voice image. Excuse me. This new image is absolutely essential in the stutterer, for without it he cannot abandon his initial fear of imperfect speech. Years ago, a lawyer from San Francisco came to me for help in overcoming a very serious stutter. Benjamin Morricone had had the condition since the age of six. He had hoped, actually, that the extra discipline and self-control required in the study of law would enable him to master his speech impediment, but his goal didn't materialize as he'd envisioned. On graduation day, as each new attorney marched to the podium and called out his name upon receiving a diploma, Benjamin grew more nervous. He wanted this day to proceed perfectly. Finally, his turn came. He, replied, he reached the stage, accepted his degree, and turned to the microphone to announce his name. B -b 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 he began. The ceremony came to a complete and embarrassing halt for two minutes as the anguished graduate tried to force out sounds that were not forthcoming. Benjamin Morricone did not, needless to say, become a trial lawyer with an impressive vocal presence as he had wished. But after many years in research, he heard about my methods of treatment and arranged an appointment. When I asked him what he wished to achieve in therapy, he said, I want to talk perfectly. He was shocked when I explained that this quest for perfection, I'm very tired, his quest for perfection had initiated his speech problem. It took almost a year for Benjamin to fully abandon his old speech and voice habits and assimilate new ones. But he did, alas, 
make the transition to healthy, successful voice use. Soon thereafter, he and his wife went to Boston, Massachusetts, to visit Benjamin's mother. Upon hearing her son talk, Mrs. Morricone screamed and then exclaimed, You're not stuttering! Your speech is perfect! No, mother, Benjamin replied. It's not perfect. In fact, it's imperfect. But it works. After all these years, it works. He had, indeed, overcome his fear and anxiety about communication. And that's a wrap.